Good afternoon, everyone. We are live. Welcome to Breaking Through the Disruption, RE Journal's webinar series. Today, we've got a great group brought to you by Bricadia. Get some housekeeping done and thank our sponsors. I've been saying this for about four or five weeks now. We had to pivot from live events to doing webinars, and we just absolutely couldn't do it without sponsors. So special thanks to Bricadia, LC, Monarch Investment Management, and Princeton. We wouldn't. We love being able to bring you smiling faces, even though you may not have a chance to get together live. Um, so without these folks, this wouldn't be possible. So extra special thanks again. If you are watching on your computer or on your cell phone and you have connection issues, I'm showing our servers at five bars and all of our speakers have confirmed they're at five bars also. So it's probably on your end if you have a connection issue. Uh, no sense in going to the chat room and saying I have connection issues. Just push the button at the top. It says reconnect. That'll solve 95% of your problems. If that doesn't work, Google Chrome is the best uh, browser we found to use. Uh, and you can also do that on your cell phone. So if your laptop or your desktop isn't working, pick up your cell phone, go into that link we sent you, click on it. If you can use Google Chrome on your cell phone, that's awesome. And you'll be able to get the same experience. So uh, there's a couple different options for you if you're having connection issues. There's a chat room to the right. I want you to go in there and put in your name, the company you work for, and state, and you can start networking and say hi to other people on live. People are still kind of joining as we get in, but we're expecting uh, north of 200 people today. Uh, this is also where you'll be able to ask questions of the panelists. So type your question in here. I'll mark it with a queue and make sure that they get to see it. We also have polls. I may throw a poll. You'll see it. It'll pop up on your screen. Last but not least, we are recording this. If you get dropped off for any reason, if you want to rewatch it for any reason, or you want to send it to somebody else, we have our own YouTube channel, but we also have now put all of these on our website. So if you go to rejournals.com, click on webinars, you can see all of our upcoming and all of our past webinars will be recorded there. You click on those, you can get the YouTube link, pass it around to your friends and uh, enjoy what rewatching what we've brought you today. Great group today. I'm going to let uh, Kevin's going to moderate, so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, let him tell you all about what you can expect from today's webinar, and we've got an, 58 minutes left. Off to you, Kevin. Great. Hey, Todd, thank you very much for uh, hosting us today. And welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's conversation. We're excited to talk to you about the Michigan and Ohio multifamily markets. We have some seasoned experts to walk us through the, uh, the landscape and provide some actionable insights amid today's COVID environment. Joining us today, Mr. Matt Lester, founder and CEO of Princeton Enterprises. Princeton is a real estate acquisition, development, and property management company that enjoys the finest reputation for successfully rep repositioning and operating a diverse portfolio of commercial, medical, and primarily multifamily assets. Princeton manages over 110 properties with approximately 25,000 apartment units in 16 states. Mr. Rob Zelina, Senior Vice President of Capital Markets, lifestyle companies out of Columbus, Ohio. Rob is primarily responsible for the aggregation and structure of all equity and debt capital to support the company's real estate endeavors and uh, developments. He's a contributor to the executive team and plays an active role in the sourcing and evaluation for all development, acquisition and redevelopment opportunities. Lifestyle has developed over 15,000 units, currently manages over 7,500 with another 2,000 planned or under construction. They've been active in 14 states and are add, adding two additional states uh, to their uh, repertoire this year. Chuck, Mr. Chuck Lavezzi, CEO or COO, sorry, of Monarch Investment Management Company. Chuck is primarily responsible for the operational side of the company and works with the CEO slash owner, CFO, asset managers, and is the liaison between the corporate office, the property sites, and regional managers quite a responsibility. Monarch has been actively involved in commercial real estate since 2004 and currently manages 59,466 apartment units in 21 states. Dory Nolan, our Senior Vice President of Client Services for Bercadia. Dory leads a national initiative to continue to grow business relationships with current clients and new clients, helping them to better understand a full potential of Bercadia services. She is also responsible for collaborating with Bercadia's investment sales and mortgage banking specialties to improve cu uh, customer support and enhance customer satisfaction. She understands uh, 
how to herd cats essentially with all the salesmen and, uh, and mortgage bankers. Today, we'll be, uh, we'll be touching on a variety of topics from collections to operations, developments to investments. So let's get started with, uh, with, the, with the event. Collections and leasing, where are we now and where might we be headed? We find ourselves in a truly unprecedented situation. A large part of the multifamily discussion has been centered around collections and operations over the past eight weeks. With stay-at-home orders having a direct, a dramatic impact on households and the economy and the rising unemployment numbers and the issuance of moratoriums on evictions. In late March, we were hearing predictions about rent collections being down anywhere from 20 to 40%. Now into May, we're seeing the actual collections are far more favorable than, than the initial story was laying out. According to the National Multi-Housing Council, 91.5% of the households professionally managed in professionally managed communities had made a full or partial rent payment as of April 26. This was an encouraging consider this was encouraging considering that that during the same time in the previous year it was 95.6%. The second iteration of Bercadia's capital market and apartment investor sentiment survey which was launched to get a sense of how our clients and partners are gauging and responding to the COVID-19 crisis. We saw a greater percentage of respondents, 89%, indicating that somewhere between zero and 19% of their tenants had requested or filed for rent forbearance as a result of the coronavirus related job or income loss for April collections. That was probably much less than the 19% that somebody uh, might have had that experience, but I believe we've seen a much lower number overall. But anyway, let's get started. Matt, if you don't mind, can you give us a brief description of your resident base uh, for the portfolio, uh, how your residents responded, what were your collections for April and, and how you're doing in May? And one other question, if you don't mind me piling on, uh, how Princeton may have prepared for the potential challenges in today's environment and uh, going forward. Sure, Kevin. And, and first of all, thank you uh, for having me on this panel, a very esteemed panel. Welcome everybody. I hope. Uh, my comments and our comments can be helpful to you. What you said is is a is a mouthful, but from my vantage point, obviously, chapter one of this response to the COVID pandemic uh, is primarily about what our revenue side and how strong it has been. Uh, you're right that in the middle of March, uh, we were quite concerned, if not outright panicked, about where we would be in terms of revenue collections, uh, and it turns out that for both. April and for May, um, we have collections in excess of 95%, and we are predominantly workforce housing uh, throughout the United States. So we're quite pleased with that. I, I would I would tell you though that um, percentage collections is not necessarily, from my vantage point, the most important metric in terms of operational performance on the revenue side. And if you wanna hear more about that, I'll share that with you after the other panelists, I think will chime in on their percentage. But obviously we're pleased with the fact that for April and May, we can say that we're north of 95% in terms of collections. Great, thank you. Chuck, if you don't mind, I'd like you to chime in and uh, follow the same same questions and I'll even repeat them for you if you don't mind describing your resident base, because it was a bit of a mouthful. How your residents have responded, uh, what how your collections have been for April and how you're doing in May and how Monarch was prepared to meet the challenges in, of today's environment. Sure, thanks, Kevin. As uh, Matt mentioned, I also appreciate being invited to the panel and hope we have some information that will be helpful for those listening. Um, Monarch, we primarily provide workforce housing. We are in 21 states, roughly 60,000 apartment units. Um, the um, collections for us, uh, we've been at about, um, in April, we were at 99.4% of our budgeted gross amount. May 19th, as of midnight last night, we were 95.5% of our budgeted amount. The 19th of any given month, we're at about 96.1% of collections. And for May versus April, 
we're at 102%. So doing a little bit better than we did in April. Um, you know, how we were preparing for this, obviously like everybody else, beginning, middle of March, uh, anticipated that we are gonna have to change how we performed and started putting new protocols in place. And we'll touch on those later in the webinar. Fantastic, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Rob, if you don't mind, I'm gonna go back over the questions for you because it's been a while since I repeated them. Uh, if you don't mind, give us a little description of your resident base, which I think is a little bit different than just straight workforce housing. Um, how have your collections been for April and how you're doing in May? And how lifestyles had prepared for today's challenges and uh, for today's COVID environment? Whoops. Rob, I think we need to get your, your microphone back on. There we go. I think. Oh. Rob, we're still not able to hear you, unfortunately. There's always one in every group. Hey, Rob, why don't you try logging out, logging back in, and we'll come back to you. Unfortunately, it was all working so well a moment ago. Right. It's always something. The internet's a busy place these days. Kevin, you want me to comment on the on the notion of percentage of rent? Yeah, I would love to hear what your your comments are regarding the revenue percentage. Thank you. I, I it's interesting because there, there are hundreds of people on this call, and I know that we all went to that metric uh, to to determine whether just how problematic the situation was but I really don't think that it that it ends there um, you know for example we were in a situation where December was better than November in terms of um, billable rent uh, January was better than December February was better than January March was better than February and so on and so on we were going to be in a year where throughout the entire year 2020 revenues were going to be increasing. So to talk about percentage of rent, which now are flat, right, because we're not doing rent increases, doesn't really tell uh, the whole story. Said another way, if you collected 100% of your rent, but your rents were below market, that's not really success. If you collected 100% of your rent, but your vacancy was it 15% or 20%, much higher than what most of us are experiencing throughout this country, um, certainly throughout the Midwest, then you can't really call that success. So for me, rather than percentage of rents, I think it's much more important to look at cash flow and cash. And I think Todd's got a slide if he puts it up. This is, this is a hypothetical. I hope it's helpful to people. If you look at it, if, if Princeton's aggregated revenue, and it's not, but if Princeton's aggregated revenue for a month was $20 million, and we collected $17 million. That would mean we collected 85% of our revenue. I just got done telling you we collected north of 95%. So you might argue that that's bad. If on the other hand, we were able to reduce expenses by the same amount, okay, through austerity, which I'm sure everybody on this panel and everybody on this call is working on, you would have had the same cash flow. This one shows debt services being flat, and we know that there are no workouts. We know it would be a mistake for anybody at this point to even be really talking about um, forbearance. That's not there yet, okay? So you would have the same amount of cash flow on a monthly basis aggregated, which is $5 million, except you'd have one additional advantage, okay? And that is you probably don't have to make any distributions in the first and the second quarter at least, okay? I can't think of a single sophisticated in investor who would have a problem with any of us on the panel or any owner in the, in the audience who said, we are gonna suspend uh, distributions in order to marshal cash and to try to deal with a crisis that is totally novel and totally unknown. So that's the primary reason why I think cash and cash flow is more important. And the last thing that I'll tell you is, I said north of 95%, and if you listen to Chuck, Chuck gave exact precise numbers. By the way, one of them he gave was that May is better than April, which is true for Princeton and true for, for uh, many others uh, in the business too. But I also would say this, we're in June, 
Okay. One of the reasons why I said north of 95% is we're in June as of today. Okay. We had a good April. We had a good May, sufficient enough to me to be happy with our cash position and our cash flow position. So what did we do today? We closed the books on revenue on May. And for the next 10 days, any revenue comes that comes in does what? It goes to the remaining number one uncertainty that all of us have in this industry. And what that is, what is June going to look like? So I think cash and cash flow are, are really going to be the difference maker between, let's see, if you want to call them winners and losers or success and failure or getting us through this crisis as much as percentage rent. And with that, I'll turn it back to you. You know, Matt, thanks for the insights. And I think you're right. And and Rob, just to give you an indication where Matt was going, because you weren't right there at the very beginning. He was talking about rev revenue versus just percentage of what he would, had built being collected. So, yeah. um, can you guys hear me this time? We can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Great. Uh, no, I, I think what, what Matt was saying uh, was, was spot on. And I would tell you that kind of going back, uh, Kevin, to your original question, um, you know, our our resident base, we are a class A uh, developer and operator. Uh, so we, we target the, uh, the single professional. It's the 28 to 32 year old uh, person's probably on their second or third uh, job. And, you know, average household income is, you know, approaches $100,000. Um, uh, like Matt and Chuck, we had, uh, we had a really strong April and May. Um, you know, we were 99% uh, collected on scheduled rent, uh, which is consistent with pre-COVID. Uh, rents um, are, are flat, they're just up slightly. Um, kind of to, to Matt's point, you know, that cash and cash flow is king. Uh, you know, we're, we're sitting at our stabilized portfolio north of 95%. So entering, uh, you know, this downturn, or hopefully just midway through this, this downturn, you know, the portfolio is in pretty good shape. Excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys are doing well. And it sounds like, you know, everybody I have spoken to and one of our other clients who Matt knows, they're in Michigan and they uh, they have uh, seven, eight, 8,000 units. They have an $8 million billing on a monthly basis. So far in the month of April, they had $64,000 identified 100 residents, asked for some sort of forbearance on their rent. That's less than a percentage point. It's it's rather a, a staggering. So from a percentage of collections, Matt, that I think everybody's doing great. And I think Chuck talked, touched on it, where they're over at 102% of where they were last year, which going, Matt, to what you were talking about. And Chuck, if I'm not mistaken, your revenues are actually up from where they were a year ago, whether it be occupancy or just rent growth itself. They're higher, correct? That is correct. And, and it's a combination of those two, Kevin. Occupancies are up. Uh, rent growth has been up. We typically average four to five percent rent growth per year. Obviously, the last sixty days we've been holding rents, um, but our occupancy has stayed, stayed strong. Occupancy has actually improved, <clears throat> and I'm sure the other uh, people on the panel have probably seen the same thing. People are less inclined to move, and uh, for those that are moving, we've been we've been working it hard to stay open do tours and increase our occupancy. Um, start of February, we're at 95.5% and we're currently a little bit north of 96.5% in terms of overall occupancy. So th that's a good segue into the next question that I had was regarding uh, renewals and current leasing activity. I know I've talked to Matt and uh, several other people around the Midwest. How have your renewal rates been since the start, since the start of this in uh, mid-February? I've heard staggering numbers that have been all positive. So, uh, Rob, you want to give us a lead on how things are going in the uh, Class A and B world with your residents? No, uh, absolutely. As, as everyone uh, probably uh, uh, understands that uh, you know, people are staying at home, retention has been improving. For our company, uh, I kind of mentioned our target demographic. You know, it's that 28 to 32 year old. So they're 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 in a transition. They're you know they're they're buying a home. They're uh, they're getting married. They're taking a new job. So uh, a good retention rate for us would be in the mid to high 40s, uh, and that's where we've historically operated. That's where we were uh, in January and February, and then as this uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic hit. You know, and we really kind of honed in on, on reaching out to our residents. 
we've seen it climb to where we're just now we're actually in the low 60 percent so uh retention is, is strong it's uh kind of what chuck was saying it's leading to uh really good uh occupancies with within our portfolio so occupancy is up and retention certainly plays a good part of that that's great it also keeps your your, your turnover costs down matt if you don't mind, I'm going to come back to you on that question. How have you experienced with the uh, renewals? So our, our portfolio occupancy is at about 94, over 94, almost 95%, which is obviously we're, we're pleased with it. And it's there's kind of more good news, and you're hearing it from Rob and from, from Chuck. Leasing activity is, at least anecdotally, um, strong. Not necessarily everywhere across the board, maybe not in some hot spots and things like that, uh, inner city Detroit, et cetera. But for the most part, um, we've been very pleased with leasing activity. And obviously, um, on top of that, the, um, the um, declinations of move outs has been you know, significant. People are staying and um, can't essentially canceling um, uh, their move outs. How long and and why, you know, why are they doing that? I mean, I think one of the things that we've learned over the past 60 days is that people truly value the roof over their head, maybe more so than 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 we realize that. And I, I think that that's a tribute to to the American renter. Obviously, the stimulus um, has helped. Um, and perhaps the fact that people aren't spending money on on other things. Uh, but we don't know how long it's going to continue. Uh, that we really don't know. Um, so, and for me, I would, um, I kind of put together in my mind a T chart. So we know on the, on the plus side, leasing activity is good. Um, cancellations of move outs are good. The fact that people are valuing uh, the roof over their head and paying their rent is a good thing. But on the negative side, um, the lost revenue, there isn't anybody on this panel and there isn't anybody on this call who hasn't lost some revenue. Have somebody on a delinquency that they cannot evict. Okay, fine, that's fair at this point. Um, and that revenue can never be recovered. As opposed to when I showed the chart um, that showed austerity to offset the revenue, that austerity is essentially an expense deferral. That roof that you're putting off because it's not necessarily an emergency or the parking lot that you're going to put off because it can wait another few months or maybe even a, another season, that's just a deferral. And so the notion that landlords haven't suffered pain, okay, despite strong occupancy, strong renewals would be false. That would be erroneous to make that statement. There has been pain. And then the question becomes how long and how deep will the pain become and that's obviously a function of things that we don't quite know how long will this level of unemployment last um how long will a recession or a retraction in our economy last how long will stimulus last so for me the correct answer is on that one we don't know but suffice it to say that for the past 60 days occupancy leasing and retention has been a very positive thing Great. You know, and, and you've touched on a number of points we're going to touch on again in just a couple of moments here. Uh, but before we do, I want to jump over to Dory because she I know Dory has been in constant contact with a significant number of national and regional players, whether it be Midwest, Southeast, West Coast, what have you, Northwest, North, South, Southwest and, and beyond. Oh, I, there's not much more beyond that. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Dory, how have you uh, experienced similar responses from have your responses from other clients been similar or are they experiencing something that's outside the new norm that we're hearing today? Uh, Kevin, generally, you know, I'm hearing the same things, um, you know, the class A products holding up better than the class B and class C product. Um, there are some hot, um, soft spots. You know, I think generally we've seen, um, you know, higher collections than originally anticipated for both April and May. Um, you know, fundamentals were really strong going into COVID. And, you know, it was interesting to kind of listen to some of, the, some of these more sophisticated institutional clients, you know, bracing for impact and thinking that, you know, the, the world was coming to an end and that we would see 
um, you know, a major material impact to collections, but pre pleasantly, um, you know, they've come in stronger and in, in that high to 90% range. You know, in terms of challenging spots around the country, we've heard um, Las Vegas, you know, the pandemic has roiled through Las Vegas, job losses have soared. Um, it's gonna be some time until we see the market rebound in Las Vegas. And I think, you know, both buyers or sellers are coming to terms that, you know, we need to be patient and um, it may not be uh, by the end of 2020 or even, you know, in the earlier parts of 2021. Also, Los Angeles is a little bit of a soft spot right now, especially in, um, you know, the west side of Los Angeles where um, the stimulus doesn't go as far. Um, where, you know, in some of the other markets, the stimulus is actually more beneficial than actually going to work, where um, the, the these are more, um, you know, renters by necessity, but the cost of housing is just so expensive. Um, so Los Angeles is a little bit of a, of a soft spot right now as well. So we're watching it closely. You know, I, I think, um, you know, as already said, you know, in terms of you know where you know what's to come, I think the unknowns. There's a lot of uncertainty still. You know what happens when the stimulus runs out. But I do believe you know multifamily um, you know remains a solid investment. Everyone needs a place to live. I think you know we will see um, you know a, a faster rebound than some of the other property sectors like hotels and and um, retail. But I think you know we're going to see some short-term pain, and then we just need to adjust to what the new normal. Um, you know, operational uh, efforts and, and uh, look like. I think that that's, you know, what we're seeing with the institutional investors right yeah. now. Great. Thank you. In fact, you know, a couple of the other, I've been on a few of the calls with you and I know the other two markets that have seen a pretty big uh, negative impact are both Houston and, and Orlando, but Orlando is actually doing okay because the stimulus and the unemployment does go a longer way in that market as opposed yep. to in LA. So, um, we're going to move on to the next topic as we all agree that, uh, as you can tell by some of these comments here for everybody, it's that housing is essential. Therefore operations must continue. And as we heard from Matt, there's a few things that have changed in how people are handling their operations and the operations from maintenance to trash collections or to virtual tours and signing leases. Homeowners are, are, uh, having to adapt as are the owner, as the, uh, operators and management companies. Operationally, we have all had to overcome the challenges of COVID, most notably working from home and uh, with technology that's been thrust upon us to some degree. While everyone has adjusted to handle different operational challenges, uh, we continue uh, challenges, continued uh, strong rent collections. Fortunately, we've been favorable there, but we've had to, main, we've had to adjust or maintain different leasing standards uh, or styles anyway, whether it be a virtual tour uh, or providing PPE to the staff so that they can handle client, uh, potential residents. All of you had, had to adjust to some of the different demands uh, with your staff uh, or your properties. Is it something that maybe trash pickup is a little bit more uh, intense? Maybe it's becoming an issue. There's a lot of tenants staying home, a lot of garbage going out to the, uh, to the, to the dumpsters. Uh, internet demands, overwhelming package deliveries, you know, Chuck, if you could give us a little bit of uh, feedback on that. I know Matt touched on some of that a few minutes ago, even going to, gee, we had some capital improvements we're going to hold off on because we're just not sure how certain things are going to be uh, handled or what we're going to see. And that could be increased expenses with some of the new styles of operation that we have to go through. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. You know, for the most part, um, our operations have remained pretty stable from the corporate office um, it's much more conducive to accommodate work at home requests. We've been operating at about 25% capacity here in the home office, about 75% working from home. By June 1st, we expect that to be uh, flip flop 75% back in the office and 25% at home. And probably by mid June, we expect to be 100% back um, in the office. Now, uh, as Kevin mentioned at the beginning, we are located in Colorado. So our situation is a little bit different than Ohio and, and Michigan. Um, from the property side, we've primarily stayed um, staffed. Uh, we've kept the, op the offices open to the extent we can, to the extent we're permitted to, with some of the stay-at-home orders. 
but it's a lot harder to do work from home from the office. Uh, but our, our staff has been fabulous. I mean, I cannot um, commend the staff enough. Um, they've been coming in, they've been working. Uh, we've gone to great lengths to get the PPE equipment for the maintenance folks. We've set the office up where we have safety zones. When the offices were allowed to be open, we'd set them up where there's safety zones where the residents could come so far into the office and have a six to eight foot barrier from the staff. Um, and staff felt comfortable with that. Obviously masks if they're comfortable. As we start off at opening the offices back up, some of the offices are getting the sneeze guards for added protection. Um, so our, our, our on-site staff, I just can't say enough good words about them. They've been great. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, Rob, you want to fill us in on how you may have handled some of these uh, challenges over the past few weeks? Sure. And I think I think Chuck did a great job of talking about the, you know, our company or his company and how the, the employees have performed. And you know, the, the frontline workers, the, the, the site personnel have, have done a tremendous job. It's, it's funny, there was a time when we were thinking, do we need to close our, our leasing offices? And uh, we made the decision to, to, to make them safe and to, to keep them open, that it was an important connection point with our residents. And I think you know, that's a piece of the puzzle that's leading to uh, you know, the collections and things that are going on. Um, uh, Kevin, you, you touched on kind of the application process and, and what are we doing uh, differently. I, I will tell you that we, we pivoted pretty quickly to virtual channels um, like most probably have. Um, it's really tech that we've been working on for the last maybe 18 to 24 months that we really accelerated in the last 60 to 90 days. Uh, but uh, you know, people were hesitant to come in. And you know, one thing that we really try to do at LC is to, to build a personal connection with each of uh, one of our residents. And, and now we were challenged with building that uh, connection uh, virtually. So, you know, we, uh, our website functionality and improving that uh, to really, you know, full non-contact leasing, and, but not just uh, leasing, but making it easy and making it complete. So we're trying to remove any point of friction that could exist between trying to do something online and going in and seeing it for yourself. Uh, so we have 24 seven chat. Um, and again, the experience is meant to be as personal as it can be. Folks are at home and they're online and it's a, it's a good way to, to advertise uh, our product. Um, other things that we're doing, uh, we do FaceTime tours. So a, a leasing consultant can take the phone and walk and talk you through uh, the property. We host uh, virtual group tours. It's a little more formal than the FaceTime tour, but you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, a, a leasing agent and the property manager can take uh, uh, you on a virtual tour that's, that's done with uh, professional grade cameras. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit of, a, of an increase or improvement on just maybe uh, of the virtual reality aspect that's out there. And then lastly, uh, all of our sites are set up to have self-guided tours, which is just really, um, a way for a resident to come in and still kick the tires. We have a select amount of units that you know, get, get sanitized after each person is in there. So they can come in, they can go to the unit, not interact with anybody, but actually see the physical project uh, or uh, product and know that uh, they're in a safe environment. That's fantastic. It's, a, it, it's important that everybody had to pivot. It's a, it's a term I've heard a lot lately, uh, pivoting just to get back to the virtual channels, get to the FaceTime tours. I like that idea. Uh, it's more personable. How have you had to deal with trying to stay in touch with your residents? Have you built a social networking platform for your managers or your, your staff to stay in touch with your residents this way? Uh, yes. Yeah, so again, you know, the, the connection is very important uh, to us. So the relationship of keeping the site, uh, the leasing offices are uh, open is a, is a very important touch point uh, uh, to us for that connection. We do have it uh, through uh, through FaceTime and various social media platforms that we do communicate with them. We also have uh, the app. So our residents um, have an LC app that they can get updates, uh, they can communicate with site, they can order from uh, our restaurants as well. Fantastic. Matt, uh, with your portfolio, well, how have you uh, adjusted it? Has it been pretty similar to what both Rob and Chuck have uh, experienced, or have you had something a little bit different along the way? 
So I, I would say more similarities than, uh, than, than differences. What you're hearing from both of them, and I, I love listening to both, both of them, is when it comes to operations in, in this time where we've had to pivot under crisis, you've got to have a plan. Um, and I'll fly through ours and it'll, you'll see some of the crossover between Chuck and Rob. Basically what we did at Princeton is as soon as this, it became clear that this was a crisis, we went into a, a war, basically a war mentality. And, and the first thing that we did is that we broke it down into phases because you have no idea how long this is going to last. And if you try to plan too far in ahead, three months, six months, nine months, it quickly becomes overwhelming. So for example, phase one for us was April, May, and June. And it's pretty clear that we think we're gonna succeed um, as it relates to phase one. Just quickly, I'll tell you that phase two for us is July and August, and that is completely an unknown. Um, so the first thing was to, was to just have a, have a plan. Uh, the, second, the second prong of it is protection. And you heard this um, from Chuck and from Rob protect your employees, protect your residents, and protect your properties. All critical, okay? Before you go on offense or think about something else, you don't have a strong property management company if you aren't in a position to put your employees first as it relates to COVID protocol um, and as it relates to, to other strategies. Same is true for residents as it relates to protocols, cleaning, it's, it, communicating, et cetera. And you heard, uh, I think Rob mentioned, um, have your staff, have your property staff and have them be open. Uh, that's the best way to protect them. The next prong for us, number three, was maxi maximizing revenue. We talked a lot about this, um, whether it's allowing people to pay online, ACH, Venmo, special programs, discounts, and even raffles and things like that to incentivize people to pay rent, perhaps payment plans. Everything designed under this, this Roman numeral three to maximize collections. Number four for us was to attack expenses, which we talked about. One of those things that I would add to this is a reduced payroll. In the case of Princeton, we reduced our payroll by about 15%, but the vast majority of those folks uh, wanted to be, either wanted to be laid off, okay, because they were concerned and we wanted to respect those concerns, or we felt uh, that either through a pre-existing health condition or some situation like that, that they were better off, it was safer for them to not be at work. So attacking expenses through payroll, through CapEx, through austerity uh, is Roman numeral uh, four. For us, Roman numeral five was a mortgage strategy because even though there's, there's no workouts that are going on, it's certainly a time when if you can, you wanna be refinancing. These are historically low interest rates. I mean, hist historically beyond historically low interest rates. And the lenders surprisingly, are still open for business. And so we were in a, in a few instances able to avail ourselves of refinance opportunities uh, and to eliminate recourse. We also did some things under this category like prepaying mortgage rents. We own uh, several properties in the Bakken Oil District in North Dakota. Uh, when oil hit uh, under $10 a, a barrel and believe it or not, it actually went to zero, I think even negative for a very, very brief time. We made the decision to prepay all of our mortgages in the Bakken escrow those payments for a 12 month period. And we did that and our lenders loved it. And it was strategic obviously, but then even other things under this category, like being aggressive with your replacement reserve requests. Uh, that money needs to be in your hands, not in the lender's hands. Uh, and then the final piece of it is, is communication, communicating with your investors, communicating with your employees, communicating with your lenders, communicating with your residents. And then as Rob said, um, it is a technology pivot, there's no doubt about it. And really what it is, is it's not a change, it's an acceleration. That's the word that he used and he's correct. Uh, all of us, uh, I think if we've been prudent, have thought about how to accelerate our move into the technology arena. So, but the main, the main point that I wanna make to people is whatever your plan is, and there's clearly crossover between what Todd discussed and Rob discussed and how Princeton is attacking this problem, you have to have a plan and then you have to be flexible enough to change it and you have to be sensitive enough to understand that this is not only about you. Wow, those are great answers on all three parts and I greatly appreciate everything, uh, all your insights and I'm sure the audience does as well. 
Uh, and I know there's a few operators out there that are taking good notes. The, uh, there's something they can learn from that, that's for sure. Um, as it relates to that, Matt, I appreciate you going through all six points on yours and, and Rob and Chuck as well. The, uh, let's move into a new topic for a few minutes here. And it's regarding the new developments and renovations, uh, what the future could look, look like in a work at home environment uh, or a work at home world in, in certain circumstances. I'm not gonna ask about the office industry. We don't really know if they're gonna be needing more space or less space, but some way that's gonna be affected. But as it relates to multifamily, uh, we expect that COVID-19 here could have a lasting impact on what multifamily developments look like, especially for, uh, if more companies embrace this, this work at home policy or even more flex time. So Rob, if you don't mind in your opinion, being the, the primary developer of new product, what is the what does the future multifamily development look like for you guys uh, for lifestyles? Is sure. it similar in the recent past, or are there new amenities, uh, floor plans that uh, that might help the work at home environment? Well, uh, thank you, Kevin. I think the the short answer is yes. At, at LC, uh, you know what we do is we, we try to continuously listen to our residents and get their feedback. So. What's going on today hasn't changed what we've kind of always been doing. So the, the units that we're bringing online today were designed three years ago and they were done uh, from the, the customer research uh, back then. Um, I think what has us maybe uh, a little more prepared than, than average is, uh, you know, the, the, our target demographic tends to work from home. Maybe it was one or two days a week. Now it might be three to four, but we were hearing that uh, years ago. Um, so the things that we've done is, uh, you know, we have the in-unit workspace that's, that's already uh, been developed and we're, we're delivered, we already have those units, high-speed Wi-Fi throughout. Um, but, uh, you know, our newest properties now have co-working where we, hey, people do want to, to work, or need to work from home, want to work from home, but, but don't want to always be in their units. So we've actually taken... Uh, what was leasing office space, halved it and made the other co-working. So made a, 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 a common amenity out of that. Additionally, we have, I, I mentioned briefly that we do have restaurants uh, in, in all of our communities and it's restaurants that we own and, and operate and it kind of becomes this social collective. And again, that was, that's something we did years ago uh, from hearing from our residents, but what that's turning out to be is, hey, people like the co-working concept, but maybe want it to be a little more informal. And they're using our restaurants and, and coffee shops for that. So it gives these uh, our, our residents a place to hang out uh, during the day, whether it is a work environment or a more in, informal environment. But uh, we think that that's kind of the uh, uh, where the direct direction of development is going. That's fantastic. And so it, is it relates to the co-work space? almost a WeWork type of space where they have their own cubicle or something of that nature in the clubhouse? Yep, it's, uh, it's got uh, conference rooms that you can rent out if you need. It's got the, uh, the, the shared working spaces. So it, you know, it, it runs uh, you know, a couple thousand square feet we usually set aside and you know, the, the revenue piece of that. And you know, I think uh, you heard Matt talk a lot about uh, you know, getting through this and, and protecting the cash flow is you know renting that space out and, and uh, finding new revenue generating sources and we think co-working is one of those excellent so um matt and uh and chuck as you guys do renovation of some some assets i know you reposition them to, to some degree uh knowing your portfolios you don't do deep dive value add renovation programs but do you see anything that you would be doing differently if you're going to take a class b to a B plus to an A, a minus type of property. What, what kind, type of packages or what type of programs might you include? Would it be a new package pickup system, uh, different social media events, uh, share workspace like, like Rob was share, talking about there in the clubhouse? Anything that uh, you would see different uh, either Chuck or Matt? Go ahead, Matt, I'll follow up. Oh, we lost his. Uh, we lost your microphone, Matt. I said, I think Rob. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Rob really hit the nail on the head. The only thing that I might add is, you know, I, this is a time where it's okay to say I don't know, and I don't True. know the answer to that. Okay. Um, value add. 
what are going to be what are the amenities or or the things that people are going to going to look for and place a higher premium on uh, in the new normal that we're hoping to get to before too long? Um, I'm not sure. I think much as much as things are going to change, the fundamentals will stay the same. Um, quality units, quality maintenance, um, things like that are, are still going to be super important. And but I think that the the wise move is at this point to sort of wait and see um, what may change in terms of mixed use, multifamily, uh, urban versus suburban, um, uh, townhouse style versus garden style uh, versus high rise, et cetera. Uh, time will tell. Um, and, and I think patience will pay off. No, I think you're right on a lot of those points. Chuck, what do you think? Yeah, so thanks. Um, you know, as both um, Matt and Rob mentioned, for us, we, we're primarily workforce housing, uh, middle of the country. We don't do any new development, so we're in a different situation than, than Rob is. Um, we may do, you know, per property, two or three mid-grade renovations per month, spend three to five grand a unit. So for us, we are holding back on some of the unit upgrades. Um, I think the residents are more concerned about rental rates right now. We've seen less of a demand for an upgraded unit. They're, they're not as concerned, rather not pay the extra $100 a month or so. So as far as those upgrades go, we are slowing down on them, but certain properties, certain markets, we will still consider them. Um, you know, for us, um, it's been a pretty stable market and, and we anticipate much of the same. Great. Thanks guys. Uh, I don't disagree with the wait and see attitude, man. I've heard that from a few people as well. Uh, making sure that, you know, the work at home, they still believe that there is a synergy to being in the office. So some people still want to have their, their employees there uh, versus everybody working from home. So there's going to be some adjustments going forward. That's for sure. So let's uh, jump or pivot, if we can, to another to the final topic, really. It's investments. How to underwrite and acquire in today's market. Uh, thank you, by the way, for all the great comments and actionable insights on, on the operations and leasing and, and how, what we're seeing. Uh, now, what I consider to be the meat of the conversation, you know, with my perspective on the industry, are investment values and acquisitions. Uh, in most of our, in our most recent investor sentiment survey, when asked about the anticipated activity in the near term, respondents were slightly more optimistic than in our first survey. Uh, to actively target acquisitions in the, in oppor uh, act, excuse me, actively target acquisition opportunities in the next 30 to 90 days is what is uh, something they're more optimistic about. Our activity, our active management respondents averaged a response of 3.1 out of a scale of 1 to 1.5. So they were below two and a half on the first survey. So we've definitely made some gains there as it relates to optimism. Uh, in terms of anticipated offer activity, however, they're a little more cautious in the next 30, day, 30 to 90 days. Uh, according to Real Capital Analytics, individual assets fell 12%, uh, sales fell 12% in the first uh, quarter, year over year. And they were down 38% in the month of March. Now I'm going to have to pat uh, some of my partners in, on the Great Lakes team here at Berkadia. We actually had the best first quarter uh, or the best quarter we've had on record in, in several years. So I don't know where everybody's seeing that, but it uh, seems to be doing pretty well here in the Midwest for at, at that point in time. Uh, but yeah, we're starting to get things off market or starting to get things moving again. So hopefully we can get the activity going. So anyway, Dory, have you, you've been on a, uh, several large institutional private equity clients uh, calls over the past few weeks. How do they see the market? Are they buyers, sellers, or are they going to have a hold, hold uh, and wait uh, attitude? Yeah, great question, Kevin. You know, there's 400 billion of dry powder sitting on the sidelines, readily available to invest in multifamily when the when you know the time is right and that's the you know the million dollar question is when is the time right um you know I, I would say in the middle of march everyone just immediately hit the pause button you know they moved to the sidelines and they were just kind of looking in to see you know what's available how do we get deals done 
you know, the stuff that was further along, there were they, we were able to figure out a way to bridge the gap and get those transactions closed. Um, you know, in, in creative ways, you know, it's some some of those transactions did result in some pricing discounts, um, and then others were just you know terms how to you know deal with um, extensions in order for buyers to get debt or you know holdbacks um, in order to kind of complete you know due diligence and get into units given you know what was happening with COVID. But we our our phones are ringing off the hook right now in terms of just general interest in finding ways to access opportunities. Um, not saying that they're buyers, but they want to see everything. I think you know the sellers largely aren't selling unless they can get pre-COVID pricing. The buyers feel they need something you know, to kind of offset the uncertainty and the lack of co uh, confidence in underwriting going forward and what rent growth looks like or you know, what collections look like. Um, you know, I think Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, you know, signed up some record numbers last week. I heard Fannie Mae signed up to over two billion dollars of, of new loans last week. Five percent of those were acquisitions versus ninety five being you know straight up um, uh, refinances. So I think there's an advantage if you want to be a first mover. You know, I think it's largely going to be the larger private um, owners that, and investors that are going to be the first movers versus some of the larger more defensive, patient, um, uh, institutional investors. And then we can't ignore the 1031 buyer. You know, they're in the market every day. And that's been, um, you know, a, a segment of the market that we've been focused on is making sure that we have great visibility um, and focus on, on those 1031 exchangers. While the uh, IRS did extend um, the identification periods and the closing timeframes, through um, through um, July for those um, you know to offset some of the stuff with COVID, um, you know they are still in the market and looking to access opportunities. You know we also are seeing you know larger institutions looking to pivot, and while they may have been you know just wholly owned acquirers or joint venture um, partners. You know they are looking for you know looking at pref or mesdad or bridge opportunities to kind of move around in the cap stack but still be present and they're in their target markets so the other things that we've heard on, on the front line from my perspective is that the well we have 400 billion in multifamily act uh targeted for the acquisition of multifamily assets is a better way of putting that Hospitality buyers are coming to multifamily, retail buyers are coming to multifamily, and office buyers are coming to multifamily. So there's an influx of capital coming into our market. That leads us a little bit to pricing. You know, you had mentioned that some of them are looking for opportunities, and I'm going to look to everybody on the call here for a little bit of pricing. At one point, I was hearing that it, it, pricing should be adjusted somewhere from 5 to 15% uh, in, a, in a discount. And I sat there going, okay. I listened for the first two weeks because it was early uh, April and late late March, and I was in the middle of transactions that were being uh, discussed of some negotiations. The biggest hit we had was 1.2% uh, on a $50 million transaction, and it really had to do with some interest rates and timing. Now, as it relates to that, with all that equity and these low interest rates, and operations seem to be maintaining at least collections and, and revenue seem to be maintaining. Uh, Chuck, Matt, Rob, or, or even Dory, do, do you see any bit major adjustments? Do you see a distressed market? Do you? What are you looking for today? I think I know the answer for each of you, but I'm going to let you share share your business plans with uh, with the uh, audience here and see see what we can uh, see how that goes. Well, Kevin, this is Rob. I can chime in on on that if you Great. like. Uh, I think you're right. I think transactions that are happening uh, today or either pre-COVID negotiated or you have someone that just has to sell. If someone has to sell in this market, uh, expect some sort of discount. Uh, but there is a lot of capital uh, on the sidelines waiting to be deployed. And you're right in terms of going into specific asset classes, multifamily is benefiting from being one of the last uh, guys standing. So I, I think you're right there that there's plenty of money and there's fewer opportunities. Um, but there still is a disconnect. The equity is sitting there saying, hey, let's go find great opportunities uh, at a discount. And the sellers are saying, hey, uh, you, know, you heard it on the call. Things are fine. I think the tell is the next 
90 to 120 days. I mean, what happened to this country, to our economy was very rapid. Uh, and people thought that, you know, if the, the, the light switch was just going to go off and, and cash was going to stop at, you know, if there's going to be a slowdown, you know, slowing down an economic engine like this is going to take time. And, you know, so I, you know, it was April. And as soon as April came in as well, it's not really going to be May. I, I'll tell you, the tell is the, the late summer and, and how this thing really impacts the operations and what you'll see from, uh, from uh, a sales activity. Um, for LC in particular, um, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, developers and we're long-term holders. So we're that, we're that build the core client and we try to take a very long-term generational approach to what, uh, to what we're doing. Um, so, you know, the things that we look at is, you know, access to capital, um, you know, no matter what the economic environment is, uh, you know, our company has been around for 25 years. So we've seen some downturns before, but having access to capital, uh, and you heard you know, Matt talk about the very low interest rates. It's important to have access to that, have the right relationships to see through the good times and the bad. From an uh, underwriting perspective and, and how we look at new deals, uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I couldn't tell you. Do we expect to see some uh, some pricing on from subcontractors come in? Yes, we're starting to see that. Um, are we stressing our rents? Uh, Yes, you know, but the things I'm underwriting today, I'll be delivering in two or three years. You hope that, you know, two or three years out, you've, you've recovered the rents that you're, you're seeing today. Um, but, you know, for LC, it's, uh, we're, we're long, uh, long-term long holders. We're long in the markets that we're in. And it's really a 30-year play, not so much like a 30-month play. Got it. Matt? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll give you my, my two cents. So, you know, cap rate compression over the last couple of years slowed our acquisition, um, our ability to acquire multifamily assets significantly. And we'd love to go on offense, but uh, I'm in that camp uh, asking, where is the COVID discount? And you heard Dora say, you know, the sellers are reluctant. They want the pre-COVID pricing. In some cases, some of the deals that I'm seeing, and we still look at deals every single day, it feels like a COVID premium. Uh, and and I'm, I'm shocked by it. And I, and I don't think it'll last. And to me, if I were a seller, if I were a seller today, which I'm not, but if I were a seller today, I would, I would be considering a 10 to 15% discount on an asset, uh, wanting a verified true performer of a buyer. Um, in my opinion, it is a great time to be a seller. It's an absolutely great time to be a seller because uh, the financing is available for your buyers. There is a dearth of product. And you heard Dora say there's $400 billion worth of, worth of cash. And there's going to be deals. And if you're a seller, to be able to get into the marketplace, and I'm not even talking about special servicing because we don't know how deep the special servicing pool is is going to be in terms of assets coming to market. Although clearly, clearly there's going to be some of that. Okay. There's no question about it. But what about the owner who is 70 years old, 75 years old, 80 years old and cannot pivot, doesn't, doesn't, isn't going to be working remotely. Okay. From home, isn't going to accelerate uh, on the move towards technology and yet can get, even if they had to get a 10% discount, from what was historically low cap rates. Um, I would recommend any of them on this call, they ought to call you. They ought to bring their assets <laughs> to market because now's, a, now's an outstanding time for them, them to be a seller. And my own personal opinion is the tail on this um, pandemic, even though I'm optimistic, it's still gonna impact that real estate valuations. Uh, and it's gonna, it's gonna impact it potentially for a few years. So I would encourage people to take advantage of what is a, an incredibly strong seller's market. Maybe even consider the Lester question, how about that COVID discount? Okay. Chuck, you guys are buyers. Yeah, we are buyers. Um, as Rob mentioned, I still think there is a disconnect. I agree with him on that. Um, I, I hope that that disconnect is coming back in line a little bit. Um, you know, unlike Matt, we have been active over the past three, four, five years. We've purchased probably 20 properties plus or minus per year. 
So we have been very active. Uh, we're, we, we still are active. We're actually closing a property this week that we won at an auction a month ago. Um, we are under contract on another property. Uh, this one's in Indiana that we've completed our due diligence on. We'll be closing that one in June. Uh, Bobby Nichols was originally supposed to be the panelist on this call. I'm uh, subbing for Bobby. He's actually on his way to North Carolina. Um, we're doing due diligence, looking at a property out in North Carolina. So we still are active. Um, I, I agree with Dory. There's a lot of dry powder on the sidelines, and I don't know how that's going to play out. Um, we fall into the large private equity group. Most of our funds come from family and friends. Um, they're still active. They want to invest, still a safe harbor. So, you know, on the underwriting side, we're definitely more conservative. Uh, we, you know, are uh, probably staying flat on rents, at least in year one. On the expense side, you know, on the, on the debt side, you have to take the tax insurance escrows that we do primarily Fannie and Freddie debt. So we have to take the escrows that they're accounting for um, into account in our underwriting, the debt service requirements, uh, escrows there, we have to take into account in our underwriting. So we are more conservative, but but we're still active. Good. Um, great. I, you guys, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. It's, it's three o'clock or 3.01. I did say that we try and keep this to a, a one hour timeline. I have one question that came in from the uh, chat room. If you guys have time, raise your hand. If not, we can uh, we can end things right here and say thank you to everybody in the audience for joining us. So what do you think? Do you have two more minutes? You ask sure. us and that's fine. <laughs> Good, okay. So from one of our uh, people in the chat room, they, do any of the panelists feel there's a false sense of optimism because of the stimulus? More specifically, does the recent rehires of, of the big three seem permanent? Are we judging the rebound early because of this? So we, you know, you can sort of pull answers out of today's presentation, but that's a pretty direct question for us to get to. I would so, Matt, what do you think? There, there is a, a false optimism. I think that we are in this period of a great pause. Um, we have mass unemployment. The, uh, the feds have stepped in in a very big way, larger than uh, in the great financial crisis, and it's bought us some time. And we're sitting here, and you've heard guys uh, on the panel say the portfolios, absent COVID, are doing just great, and, and they are. Um, but, you know, I said as we go through the summer, and if people uh, aren't getting back to work and the employment isn't recovering, I think you're going to see a, uh, a more of an impact on collections and on, on property value. So I would say that right now it is a false sense of optimism. I characterize it more as just we're in, we're in a pause period. Okay, that's fair. I would, uh, Kevin, my two cents to that question would be that um, I consider myself uh, an optimist and uh, I am optimistic that we will recover and I'm optimistic about our American way of life but I would describe it not so much as a false sense of optimism. Uh, Greenspan had the fam famous uh, uh, combination of words, irrational exuberance. That's kind of how I feel like it. It's maybe irrational uh, op optimism or over optimism, even for those of us who are optimistic. And if you want my opinion and an indication of that, ask yourself if you think that the, that the stock market is, uh, is fairly valued at this point or other asset classes. The last thing that I would say is it's interesting. The hope, so the the, the uh, hospitality people and the and the retail people are going to come into the multifamily space. I'm not so sure. First, they're going to have to deal with their own problems. And you know what? To the extent that they come into to the multifamily space, some of us may start to leak into their space too. So yeah, I think I think we've got a bit of a road ahead of us. And I think that um, there's a little bit of irrational behavior. Is it caused by federal stimulus? Maybe. Maybe that's part of it. It's certainly attributable to probably a myriad of factors. Great. Fantastic comments. How about you, Chuck? Yeah, I mean, in, in, as Matt mentioned, in terms of some of the other ones coming to our space, we're not as worried about it. Um, you know, we, we manage all of our own properties. We don't manage for anyone else. We don't use any third parties management for our 
property. So anyone coming into our space that's not familiar with it, um, you know, we're going to have a management advantage over them, we believe. So we're not as worried about that. Um, in terms of the false sense of security, I'm, I'm going to quote Matt from earlier. It's okay to say we don't know. Um, you know, we'll, we'll know a lot more what happens in July, whether they're going to do an extension of the CARES Act. Um, if they do do an extension of the CARES Act, what, what shape it's going to take. You know, I think we're, we're pretty good up until July as co people continue to receive the unemployment benefits. Um, you know, hopefully the retail sector will come back. People will get back to work. As I said earlier, we're primarily workforce housing. So, um, you know, a lot of our people um, have been laid off or have had their hours furloughed. Um, so we'll, we'll know more late summer, early fall in terms of what sense the CARES Act or any extension thereof takes. Well, we cer certainly hope they do extend it. Otherwise, uh, there'd be a little disruption in the market pretty quickly in the fall, I would think. So, but uh, our comments today have been fantastic. I've gotten great comments on the chat board for all of you guys, thanking you all of you guys for joining us today. I wanna personally thank Matt, Chuck, Rob, and Dory. Uh, this has been a phenomenal uh, experience for me to be a moderator and go uh, present uh, these questions today and get your, your feedback. Thank you for joining us. And I think uh, that's gonna conclude our event for today. And there'll be, uh, Todd's gonna tell us there's a recording that will be out of for this as well. You took the words right out of my mouth. Great event, good group. Uh, we recorded this. It'll be on our YouTube channel as well as our website. I gotta thank our sponsors again before everybody logs off. Percadia, LC, Monarch, Princeton. Couldn't do this without you. Uh, don't forget about the YouTube channel and we're here for you. So to the extent that we end up still not being able to get together, we're continuing to work our action plan and help you all find ways to interact, network, and get deals done. So thanks everyone who's online. Thank you panelists, wonderful event. Look forward to doing it again soon. Great, thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Guys, Todd, Rob.